Hello, everyone, and welcome to Winning the War on Education, Innovate or Perish. My name is Rod Vester, active moderator for today's panel. Let me say uh, first say happy 25th anniversary to my Sphinx family and thank you, Abigail Vinman and Alpha Dworkin for this opportunity. Today, I am joined by an outstanding and brilliant group of musicians who all come with a wealth of knowledge and expertise. Before they introduce themselves, we welcome your questions via the comment section. We want to hear from you, so please do not hesitate to type your questions. Now I turn to my fellow panelists for their introductions, Leah, Barrett, then Artina. Thank you so much. What a great pleasure to be here. My name is Leah Uribe, bassoonist, uh, bassoon professor at the University of Arkansas and associate chair of the department, originally from Colombia, South America. Hello, my name is Barrett Hypes. Uh, I'm the Dean of Student Development at the Juilliard School in New York City. Uh, and I'm excited to be here with Leah, uh, given that we both uh, attended the same institution for a short period of time at the University of Arkansas. Uh, thrilled to, to spend some time with everyone on this panel. And hey, everyone, my name is Artina McCain, and I am coordinator of the keyboard area at the University of Memphis, originally from Dallas, Texas. And I'm also happy to be here with you, Rod, and Leah and Barrett to um, discuss our topic today. Thank all of you. So our first question, um, challenges are often part of a broader societal disruption, which spill over into our institutions and impact the students that we interact and engage with. With this in mind, we have seen that students are reporting higher rates of depression than before the pandemic, with graduate students reporting depression and anxiety at rates six times higher than that of the general population. Understanding that mental health can negatively affect academic performance, how have you all responded to this growing concern? And additionally, have you found any disconnects between administration and faculty? I'll start with you, Barrett. Um, yes, uh, uh, such an excellent question uh, that, that, that we had discussed. Um, student mental health is uh, a primary concern of mine working in student development. Uh, most of the offices that I work closely with um, interact with students uh, constantly on a, a, a daily basis and kind of like a 24-7 basis. So um, we've certainly seen um, our students uh, experience in my opinion, more mental health issues uh, given the results or given the uh, kind of state of the pandemic uh, at present and over the last two years. Um, there are ways that we've tried to react and respond to that as educators, but what's uh, challenging for me is we get to know our students. I mean, Juilliard's a pretty small school. We have 850 students, roughly, give or take. Um, we get to know our students pretty well from the time they set foot on campus for uh, moving into the residence hall and orientation. And we've been uh, sort of denied that uh, as a team of student development for the last uh, couple of years uh, in that our face-to-face -face interactions with our students are less like what we would hope them to be, which are uh, high fives, handshakes, punches on the shoulder, like hugs that we would normally uh, see of our students and, and the ways that we would normally interact with our students. Uh, so we're we're sort of like doing a double and a triple orientation uh, as an institution. We want to invite uh, all of these students that have been a part of the Juilliard community, but in a lot of ways, like mostly or at least partly um, online. They've been doing a lot of their performance activities in person, but they haven't been spending a lot of time with um, our student development team which is, uh, you know, I feel critical to uh, the students overall uh, development and bridging the gap between uh, their time as a high school student and into college. So we have definitely seen um, an uptick in uh, mental health, uh, I don't want to just say issues, mental health um, uh, concerns uh, that are, I, I, I feel directly uh, connected to the fact that the students are not connected to us uh, as closely as they would normally be in a given year. Uh, we have an excellent uh, counseling services team um, and we, you know, certainly have a lot of uh, appointments where, you know, our students are certainly utilizing the counseling services that we provide, uh, you know, but again, it's uh, for, for us, it's like the day to day. We miss, we miss the connection with our students in a way that 
uh, in my career, I never have, I've never missed it as much as I do now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barrett. Um, Artina. Yeah, sure. I mean, I just want to echo everything that Barrett just said. We definitely have more student mental health struggles. Um, but I, you know, honestly, as an educator, most of my interactions are one-on-one -on -one with my students, you know, in the keyboard studio. And I think that one of the most important things we can do is to encourage them to seek counsel. I, I, I really feel strongly that as a musician, you know, I'm trained to be a musician. I'm trained to do certain things on the stage. I'm trained to do certain things in the teaching studio, but I don't feel that I'm always trained to be a mental health provider. So I think the best thing we can do is be a listening ear, uh, but not to overstep the boundaries that, you know, there are people who have gone to school and who regularly deal with mental health issues pre-pandemic. And so nowadays, I mean, I even know just from, you know, circles that I'm in that it's really hard to get into a counselor. So I know that there's many people seeking out professional counseling. So that's always where I want to send my students in what I want to encourage them to do. Thank you. Elia? Similar to the situations, uh, both uh, that Artina and Barrett mentioned, um, I just want to add that the complexity of this issue is also the mental health issues that we as the mentors or professors are experiencing as well. Experiencing as well. So uh, keeping that balance between uh, keeping things under control, being support for our students, while also looking for those resources for us. Um, my university, the University of Arkansas, has been very proactive into um, organizing even more uh, the counseling services for, for students. Actually, this uh, year it was announced in a, in a recent meeting that for the first time we have somebody from psychiatry available and staff at the health center um, because they have understood that the issue is much deeper and that we weren't really prepared to attend the many uh, students and staff and faculty that needed those services. Um, I think that I want to also add that it's not only the pandemic, it's this uh, conversation about um, social, creative, racial justice, and the many uh, you know, paths that have been open for our students and for many of us as well to express our opinions and the need to have a catalyzing process and, and the support and the help to kind of guide this conversation in a way that uh, we're able to sustain without being affected as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, how do we recruit students, faculty, and staff from diverse backgrounds, be it race, culture, ethnicity, age, religion, disability, gender, or sexual orientation? Um, and what specific initiatives have you taken, you all taken, to assist in creating a diverse work environment? And lastly, yeah, I'm sorry, it's, it's a compound question. And uh, what does true commitment to hiring diverse faculty and staff look like? Uh, can I start with you, Artina? Sure. Oh my goodness, Rod. I was just thinking through the answer for the first one and then you threw me with the other <laughs> two. So um, I'll, I'll just speak of, in general, you know, something that we've done at the University of Memphis, especially in my area, is you know representation so whether that's in the artists that we bring in um you know my myself you know being a black female um my other colleague is is asian i have a white colleague as well and then also in our student body so when students come in that are of different races different genders you can say hey you know we can connect you with someone who identifies in the same way of course, I don't have to say it like that, but you can just show them that there are these people there. I think, especially for probably many of us, we walk into any room where we don't see ourselves represented and we think, oh, well, you know, this is not the room for me. So I think when students come into the room and they see other people that look like them, for our current students, we're bringing in other people that look like them while also exposing them to other groups of people because that's equally as important. Um, it really makes a big difference in who we can attract to our community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Leah. That's such a complex conversation. I think that we all agree that uh, there's so many uh, corners and uh, that need, need to be turned uh, from the basic understanding uh, in, uh, for example, my faculty at the University of Arkansas, what diversity means. What does it mean to bring a diverse uh, candidate and to actually open the doors uh, for employment um, understanding that uh, even though we all want to be diverse, uh, diversity uh, comes in uh, specifically from a diverse person. 
<laughs> so, um, and the, the, the beauty and the need also to add more uh, minority people to, um, to our body of faculty, to our students as well, uh, because it's not only about ideas, it's about, like you said, Artina, representation. It's also about uh, the type of research that we engage in. Um, I mean, there's so many ways to look at it, but, uh, but I am all about, like, we need to give a little bit of the space that has been occupied by the majority uh, for the longest time and really uh, at different demographics, at uh, different beliefs, uh, systems, at, at uh, different sexual orientations, and you name it, all of those. Um, with the students, it's the same, uh, the same thing, but I want to add, we have been working really hard, not only in the issue of recruiting, but also retention. And this is actually true for students and faculty and staff. What uh, measurements do we have in place to make sure that we're adding to those numbers, but also we have the, 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 the yeah, the, the opportunities and everything in hand to support whatever is needed to um, present our students and minority, um, whatever they are um, in whatever field um, with um, uh, equity uh, systems to make sure they can succeed in, a, in the environment. So it is a very complex uh, conversation. Um, I think that the more of us that are there educating uh, the ones that are making decisions also uh, being part of those decision-making uh, tables, uh, I think it's easier to open those spaces, uh, but there's a lot of education that has to uh, be uh, you know, provided in the process and support as well. Thank you. Bert. Well, to hear um, Leah discuss being at the University of Arkansas, I grew up in Farmington, Arkansas, which was, you know, 15 minutes, 10 minutes away from the University of Arkansas campus. Um, and it, it, I think, I'm trying to think of the year. Well, I guess when I became an RA at the University of Arkansas and we as uh, you know, student leaders had training um, or conversations and development sessions around uh, topics associated with diversity and other things, um, I don't think I ever knew or thought about do, are the faculty members or the administrators, are they doing the same thing that we are doing? Um, and it wasn't until I came into like student development as a, you know, a profession that I realized, you know, I, I, at, at times I felt like I, I did a lot more when I was an undergraduate student as an RA than what I'm doing as an administrator or as a faculty member or what's being asked of me, I should say. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I reconnected with uh, Leah not too long ago because I saw that the University of Arkansas was uh, doing a lot of interesting things around inclusive hiring practices, uh, just even inviting uh, wonderful guests uh, to discuss inclusive hiring practices. And I thought, um, you know, it's so important for us as an institution to um, consider the fact that if we don't have um, if we don't have faculty or administrators uh, that are joining us uh, with a commitment to the mission of the institution, uh, then the retention piece uh, also will fall by the wayside. So, you know, we have um, equity, diversity, equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging as a, a healthy component of our mission as an institution. Uh, so are people that are joining us, uh, are they committed to that mission as well? Um, and in what ways are we encouraging inclusive hiring practices? So. Um, yeah, that's my quick story and connection to the University of Arkansas as well. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, some experts um, have suggested that those institutions seeking to diversify their workforce should share job postings with BIPOC individuals, asking them to share the postings with their network. Um, in my mind, this suggestion re re um, relieves the institution of building relationships with those diverse individuals and communities they seek to attract. Um, so I'm curious on all of your thoughts on this type of practice. Uh, I'll start with Leah. Uh, you know, it's been my experience in this uh, committees that I have been uh, lately chairing or being part of for hiring uh, in my music department, that uh, there's no real connection yet from the university as to where to go. They are not very sure that what, what are those outlets. So I think that there's a, there's kind of a, 
double take. I feel responsible when I in those commit when I am in those committees that I have to. I am committed to letting everybody know in any way I can that this position is open uh, to make sure we have a very diverse group of applicants and hopefully a really, really diverse group of uh, finalists. Uh, but there's a lot of intentionality in that process. I am not sure that at this moment I can just say, university, you have to take care of it uh, because I believe that we still have a lot of uh, you know work that is in our hands because uh, we're so few that have actually connection and knowledge. So I know where to call and who to reach out to personally. Uh, some of you in this panel, people that have been part of this conference this weekend, that um, that I know that uh, they are going, you are going to take this information and multiply it and make sure you're telling your friend and the friend will tell a friend uh, because we're still in that, uh, in that part of the stage. And um, I, I agree with you, Rod, at some point we're going to get there, but uh, I don't think either in human resources, uh, you know, offices, we still, we don't have the capability to understand, you know, those resources, where to go, those direct lines uh, for recruiting and, and affecting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Artina? Yeah, um, you're right, Leah. Sometimes it can feel overwhelming as a committee member um, of a minority group to feel like you have that responsibility to find all the, your friends or for me, find all the black people, you know, find females, whatever. Um, but I also think that we need to hold accountable our institutions to making connections with organizations so that they can post postings. But, you know, I, I wanna go one step further if you don't mind, Rod, but I think sometimes we do have the people in the pool, but it's a check in the numbers thing. It's like, well, I have these people in the pool, but who ends up in the finals? So I, I think there's layers of problems there. Not only is it just getting the word out, but sometimes when you do get the word out, it's simply so that they can check the box to say that they had X number of minority candidates, but we still brought in, you know, all males or all white males. So then there's a couple of problems there with the, the question. Mm -hmm. And Barrett? Uh, I, I mean, I think Leah and Artina put it perfectly. I don't think I have uh, much to add other than, um, you know, we try you know to just ensure that we're um that because we say hiring practices hiring practices like um but then if we're you know attempting to diversify for example a hire a, a hiring panel you know are we calling on the same people to be a member of that panel just so that the panel looks diverse in and of itself uh and that's something i i think i've spoken to to leah about that in the past um are we relying on the same people, uh, as you mentioned, to try and diversify our candidate pool, and then also to be a part of, or like, you know, insist that they're uh, continually a part of the hiring uh, committee or the hiring panel. And that's, I think that that's, that's a real challenge. And may yeah. I add, I mean, oh, the, the oh. complexity uh, of, uh, you know, academia is, a, is an oppressive system. Uh, the tenure process, the hierarchies. So people that end up being in those committees, especially for tenure track positions, are tenure professors, and the majority of the tenure professors are not uh, minorities. So uh, decision makers tend to be the same and is natural, unless we question ourselves, uh, to tend to hire people that uh, look like us, think like us, uh, do research like us. Yeah, and it takes a while to change that landscape, you know, in any institution, and it doesn't really matter which institution you're at, because as you say, Leah, I mean, if you think about who's been there, um, they will tend to hire people who are like them, not even on purpose. I mean, I think we all have unconscious biases towards groups that we represent and that we feel are, rep are representing us. So it, it's really layered, the hiring process. And I think it also needs to maybe even move outside the building sometimes to non-biased sources so that they can show us um, some of our faults there. Mm -hmm. Great. We have some questions pouring in. So um, here's one. Uh, how do you all ensure equity and accountability in hiring practices at your respective institutions? And, and part two of that is, um, are students a part of that, uh, those discussions? Whoever wants to jump in. <laughs> 
Well, I'll jump in. <laughs> I guess since I'm not on mute. Or Leah, you please go ahead. <laughs> Well, I think sometimes students are a part of those conversations. I think a lot of academic institutions will have like a student panel come. And obviously if there's master classes or things like that, that the candidate needs to teach or work with the students. But I think the issue is how much does the student's opinions weigh into the decision? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'd love to hear you know, from Barrett and Leah on how that works at their institutions. We have added some students in the um, in, in committees lately. They are not non-voting uh, part of the committee, but they are there to uh, give their opinion uh, from the interview process and uh, uh, the master class. And, and we want we want the perspective. This is something new. We have been trying um, to to add that perspective, which I think it is very important, right? I mean, we we're also trying to kind of direct our department to a more student-centered department. That's one of our goals in our latest uh, strategic planning, uh, internal strategic planning, um, which we, th we thought we were there, but you know, things like that, having that opinion at the forefront, uh, having that experience for them as well, uh, because one of the important issues that uh, we always need to talk about is pipeline leadership. Uh, by bringing those voices, we are helping those students uh, understand these mechanisms to make decisions, understand uh, the internal functioning of a hiring committee or a selecting committee for jobs that they are going to, to be fulfilling or hopefully in the, uh, and especially for diverse uh, students making decisions as well. Uh, so many of the positions uh, within student development obviously are very much student facing and interact with students in a way that uh, is different than, you know, uh, faculty members or private instructors like their, um, their applied instructors. Um, so, you know, while we make, you know, every attempt to incorporate uh, students or a student panel uh, in the process of hiring, uh, sometimes it's not possible just based on the time of year that we might be hiring, or it might not be possible just based on the availability of uh, the students. But, um, you know, we do we do make um, an effort to include them in the process, whether that's even just going to lunch with the, the finalists or um, you know, having a, a, a meeting with the finalists and then providing us with uh, feedback. There's there are just the challenges of logistics uh, a lot of times when it comes to involving student panels, but those are a lot of things that I think we can work hard to overcome. I mean, if we need to pull them from class, we should do that. If we need to pull them from rehearsal, we should do that. If we need to, you know, we, we need to involve them in that that process because they feel so much more invested in, um, yeah, in the, the success of that administrator in my case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I just remember when I was a student, a grad student at the University of Mississippi, I was invited to be on two search committees uh, when they were hiring um, at the time, I think, a, a, not a chair of a, a chair, I think, and, and faculty. And, you know, I was given kind of all the power, you know, that all the faculty had. And I thought that was, it was a really great experience. Um, and so I know uh, the music school there, I, I guess, maybe still still does it, but at the time they were doing, you know, student involvements on search committees. Uh, we have another question here um, in in the same line of thinking. What are some good questions that university students can ask of job candidates about their experiences regarding on the job diverse actions and responsibilities? And again, whoever wants to jump in. I uh, usually we as faculty members um, get hired to fulfill teaching, service, and research. And I think since uh, that's kind of a standard for all of us, it is important to know what these candidates have done or are planning to do uh, when they, uh, if they get selected, if they, they are a successful candidate. Um, I think personally that, and the, again, the complexity of this conversation is bigger than the time we have to talk about it. But, um, you know, at these universities, my university is a research one university. We're supposed to go and change the world while my community is suffering and my community is not represented. And my nearby people uh, have a lot of barriers to uh, enter our music programs, our, uh, you know, be part of the orchestras, have access to instruments, you name it, right? Uh, 
So uh, it's a balance. I think it's important to ask these candidates, what do you plan to do with this community? How much do you know this community? And as much as the university is going to support your research at that level, what, is, what are your intentions within this community in the department of music or the school of music? What uh, uh, in the community, uh, people that live around us that, um, that perhaps and hopefully they are representing as well uh, in terms of service, what type of influence they are bringing or ideas they're bringing to create also because this is an uh, ecosystem. We are working with other arts organizations and artists in the community and uh, this conversation, if we really want to move uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, cannot pertain only to these little spaces. So um, I think it's important also to ask about the service and the plans and the experience that they're bringing at that level. And of course, research, right? I am very interested when somebody that comes to us as an applicant brings this uh, body of research that is, uh, you know, uh, has some advocacy within that, uh, regardless of their own demographics. There's a commitment to understanding this issue from a much more deeper uh, perspective with knowledge, with data, because we all know here that in order to move this at other spheres, we need those numbers, we need those uh, facts, we need that research as well. So I, uh, I that, think that's a good way to start. Yeah, I'd like to add an action step um, for a student panelist is, is do your homework. I think sometimes we forget the powerful tool of Google. Um, you can easily look up candidates and see what they're doing. I always say actions speak louder than words because definitely candidates sometimes know how to win an interview. They've practiced the questions. They know what to say, um, but the track record might say something different. So um, if you do your research by Googling, you know, whatever materials they have, I mean, there's so many things, so many people put everything out there, right? It's easy to find things and then ask questions based on what you actually saw, what their actual track record is of what they're doing. Um, and I think you'll find that you'll get some really interesting responses. Well, I also just think from uh, that it's just important for the students to um, consider what uh, what what it is that they need from their institution, what it is that they need to feel like they're at home within their institution. Um, you know, I've I, I've asked questions that students have asked before in panels, like about self care practice, or about like what do you what do you think about you know prioritizing a self care practice for 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 students. Uh, so just consider what's what's really important for them because they're they're the the spokesperson of their their community on campus. Mm -hmm. um, here's another question. Um, and starting off, uh, do the panelists um, have ideas about change adverse institutions? Um, I'm not sure if that if that terminology speaks to all of you. But the second part of this is sometimes music schools make appeals to tradition to, to resist changes to repertoire, curriculum, hiring practices, et cetera. Any thoughts on that? And if I'm correct, change aversion is like the negative um, reaction to like quick change, right? Is that what change aversion is? <laughs> I think so, okay. Any thoughts? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, uh, I have the blessing of working at an institution that's, uh, you know, we, we previously had, um, you know, an exceptional president that uh, oversaw our institution for well over 30 years. Uh, but then I got to see the transition uh, to a new president as well, um, some new uh, administrative initiatives. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we have the good fortune as an institution to witness some uh, significant change, but whether or not that is, uh, you know, enough to sort of combat the sort of Eurocentric history of the conservatory in America, um, at, what what is enough? I mean, it's uh, we're 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 behind, uh, I think, universally in a lot of ways. So, um, what are we doing to combat? I think that again, it has to do with being mindful of. Uh, inclusive hiring practices. I think it has uh, to do with uh, being mindful of um, how we talk about music. Um, and then from a student development standpoint, or not, I mean, music and the performing arts in general, but also from a student development standpoint, what are, what, what are our student needs and in what 
like where are they coming from? There's no uh, cookie cutter approach to uh, responding to every student's need when they arrive on campus because they all come from such uh, diverse uh, backgrounds and lived experiences. I mean, at Juilliard, we have 30% of our campus population is international to begin with. Uh, additionally, we have, you know, students from all over the country and uh, with, you know, all different uh, socioeconomic uh, situations. And uh, it's, yeah, I'll just, I'll stop there. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry, Leah, go ahead. I, I was in a meeting recently with our interim chancellor, uh, which we're very excited to have him in that position. And um, he was talking about exactly that change aversion and how we in academia, we think we're, you know, have these progressive think thoughts and we do, you know, the, uh, the forefront of research and, uh, you know, we have open minds and uh, no, academia is one of the most conservative spaces ever. Everything has been done in a certain way and to challenge the way uh, it's really complicated. This is really complicated. And that conversation about excellence that runs around our uh, circles all the time, we cannot change this because this is better, because this has stood you know, the test of time and how can we, uh, it is very complicated um, in, in our music world uh, to challenge those ideas and systems. And that's why I think that this is not, uh, it's always a fine line that we're walking uh, especially I, I, I do as a minority professor because uh, I cannot just present this in the nicest way. I am advocating this is uh, a life-changing experience for all that has either oppressed minds and ideas and voices or has opened, and, and I want balance, right? So um, I think that these conversations need to come with uh, advocacy. Uh, when we have those diversity, equity, inclusion committees and we're choosing who's there, we need to find those voices that are able to or willing to, to walk that line and, and to be a little pushy, a little uh, to, to poke this, uh, you know, whoever you need to, to bring the change and the awareness, because otherwise we're going to stay here for, I don't know, how many more centuries? Oh, I hope not centuries, Leah. <laughs> But um, I, I love your point. I want to just jump in here if we have a, a, a quick second. It, and I think we had this conversation in our private meeting, but a lot of time institutions react to what's happening outside of the institution. Like Leah said, you know, academia sometimes is the most conservative place that you can be. And they don't react until something mind boggling happens outside the institution that forces them to act. So I think that all of us have a really big part to play in that and the advocacy that we do in our own personal work outside and inside of the institution. Thank you. Thank you all. I want to shift now to more pedagogy. Um, so for those who are hesitant uh, to embrace or uncomfortable with cultural relevant pedagogy, what advice uh, can you offer them? And I'll start with you, Barrett. Um, I mean, I think there's just so much uh, relevance in and of itself between being culturally responsive um, particularly for some of the programs that we provide at Juilliard, our fellowship programs where students go out uh, and serve the community, um, where students uh, go out and perform in, um, you know, traditional and non-traditional settings, uh, just ways in which they engage with their audience. There's so much value in, um, you know, actually considering who exists within your audience. I mean, uh, even in our entrepreneurship course, we talk about, like, we'll use a terms like target market or target audience, but then we discuss audience segmentation and how do we consider that we're speaking to different components of our audience in different ways. So uh, for me, it's like, it, you know, it, it, it makes perfect sense for the artist to be responsive to their uh, community, their surroundings, the everyone that exists within their, their, if you want to say audience, but everyone that exists within their community um, at large. We are struggling with numbers and recruitment and, uh, you know, always trying to make sure what we do is sustainable and, uh, you know, it's important to show data, right? Uh, nonprofits, our universities, uh, donors, 
uh, we will have the opportunity to bring more voices if we represent them right? historically, and there's research out there for to to uh, corroborate this. Uh, you support causes that in which you see yourself. So there's a lot of donors out there that are not part of our uh, collective because they don't see themselves. And so if we need to convince somebody in upper administration, that's a good argument. But uh, I mean, I have challenged my own uh, music department uh, as why do we accept women in the composition uh, program? Why do we do that if we have orchestras that are not playing and just it's a very you know little segment right here of a uh, of a minority. The majority of the repertoire is by the same demographic. So uh, it's, it's a disservice to our women and add intersectional identities to these to accept them in the composition department if we're leading them to not be successful because of those changes. Well, or do we need to tell them you know be careful? Or do we need to challenge those uh, outlets? around us, you know, to make sure that we are educating them and giving them tools also to go there and push the system and for all of us also to push the system for us so they have equal opportunities outside. Yeah, uh, we have a question. Um, so an awareness has grown for the need for more relevant and representative um, curriculum and conservatories. How can this be supported from the top down and internally in schools. Who wants to jump? I go. Yeah. I go yes. to research. <laughs> I will go to research because when we hire our tenure, tenure track professors that come here to prove themselves in that track of research, if the research is in those areas, there's a lot of strength. And um, and the, the voices are very important, right, in the in the academic community. So um, that's a good point to start hiring uh, people with diverse research agendas that can actually have a point to convince at that level, if needed. I don't need that to be convinced by the wall. I have other reasons more at the human level. This is human communication and connection, right? But if that's needed and requested, then research is going to show you that this is just as important to study and to include and to be part of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I think as faculty members, you know, and students too, we have a responsibility to bring diverse voices into courses that we teach, into repertoire that we teach. And, you know, something I, I really enjoy when a student I encourage them to look for repertoire, look for things uh, by composers that you identify with and you teach me something because I'm never going to know every composer. I'm, I'm never going to know every category of representation, but I can learn quite a bit through my students and then I can bring to the table, you know, my, my own expertise is in a lot of black composers and, and that's what I perform as a pianist and, and I can bring that to the studio, right? And then we can have an exchange where we all share. And so I think there's responsibility both ways from the faculty and the students to to make sure that the curriculum is representative. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Um, in higher education, we are seeing a growing demand for interdisciplinary and real world curricular content for and from students. Um, so how do we address this concern uh, and mend these types of gaps? Additionally, seeing that most musicians engage in various activities um, you know, performing, teaching, touring, et cetera. So um, how honest should we be with music majors concerning their career paths? And Artina, I want to start with you. <laughs> well, honestly, if I can give you a shout out, Rod, I, I was thinking about these great videos that you do that oh. are so <laughs> honest about, you know, the career as a musician and, and what you should do as a musician. So I think there's, you know, there's so many artists like that that are doing incredible things. And that students should seek that out and, and to find, you know, what, what are my professors really doing? Again, kind of like the Google search, you know, what are their careers really looking like? And don't, don't be afraid to ask questions. I, I know personally, I welcome questions from students about, you know, real talk, what, what's really going to happen after school? What do my possibilities look like? Uh, there's some things that some of my teachers did was to really encourage me in the things that I was good at. I think sometimes academia sort of presents one route, you know, you're going to be music ed, you're going to be orchestral, and if you're a pianist, you're going to be an independent piano teacher, but um, the route is so diverse now. You see musicians doing so many things, um, collaborating with so many di 
different types of people. Uh, I tell my students, sometimes I wish there was a piano degree that said the holistic pianist. I, I don't understand, you know, I'm a pedagogue, I'm a collaborative artist, and I also perform solo and chamber. I don't want to be put in a box, uh, you know, and I'm sure our students don't either. So I think if we can just have and encourage honest conversations with our students about what we did, what we are doing, that can really help them. Thank you. And I, I, can, I can tell already, Artina is a spectacular mentor to her students. <laughs> I think that mentorship is just like so critical, particularly when you're in your um, early years of, of, of education as a, as a student and undergrad that's studying music and starting to think about it seriously. Uh, you know, for, for, for me, I think I was like a triple major or something as an undergrad because I wanted to back up to my backup. Uh, but I had a fantastic mentor that still to this day uh, provides me with that sort of advice and support should I need it. I think so. I think also our programs, I mean, we are all reevaluating the things that we're doing. Uh, Rod, you just presented in your institution and a brand new program, uh, right? You know, it's just, yes. just approved mm -hmm. and, and very successful to start thinking about the realities of the world we live in. And I think that the pandemic has helped us a lot with that because of the orchestra's closing. And if my uh, goal was to be the principal bassoonist of the orchestra, well, we have considerably lower number of orchestras with that possibility for the bassoonist, right? But also to tend to these uh, personal interests and to really respect that fact that, uh, you know, creative justice and the right that people have to be around music and to have a music education and then to find a path to make a living uh, that needs to be not only playing a symphony orchestra or being in academia. Uh, so in my university, we are uh, doing all the research and really opening spaces for more classes in music industry, um, data um, and, and, and music and uh, thinking about what, what our students want to do, what they bring to us. And instead of telling them you cannot join the program because you don't know your skills or you never took private lessons in trombone, um, if you you know compose beats, what is your future like and how we can aid in that process and how we're going to provide to you a safe environment in which you can actually enjoy music and make a living. Yeah, excellent. Um, so, as everyone knows, the name of this panel is Winning the War on Education, Innovate or Perish. So, uh, let's talk about what are the dangers, if any, um, of remaining stagnant as educators, administrators, and institutions. Um, and so, also, how do we begin to create a path in leadership and empower students to lead? Um, Barrett. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, well, first of all, the pathway to, for me, for our students to innovate and to lead um, is for them to, for us to just be open and honest with them about our own path and uh, kind of the ways in which we've arrived where we are at this point and also to emphasize for them that like our education is not over yet i mean we are you know faculty members we're administrators and this is you're seeing us during a part of our ongoing sort of lifelong learning so um you know i think being open and transparent with the students uh, really helps them to fully understand how we got uh, to where we are, what is it that we valued along the way, how our values shifted, um, you know, what is our overarching personal artistic vision, uh, and in which way, in what ways do we honor that vision, you know, to the best of our ability, at least each and every day. Um, that's the part I'll comment on on the question. Uh, Thank you. Um, Artina? Well, I mean, I like Barrett's answer, actually. I think honoring the vision and and just like you said, Barrett, the fact that we're all in our personal journeys is something really important to reevaluate all the time, too. I mean, I know mine definitely has changed over the years, but um, also having a vision is important as well. Thank you. I have <laughs> been having, you know, for the last 
year, year and a half, almost two years, this image that really shifted the way I think about these issues radically. And it is that we are responsible for the balance or lack thereof in society. That uh, the, if we continue perpetuating these spaces that are not welcoming to all, we are completely agreeing for injustices that are happening very close or far away from us that, that we are aware of. So I think that this is a responsibility you, we have. Uh, I have it with my own kids. I have it with my students. I have it with my community. I have it with the communities that I represent, and like many identities that come with me um, that have been discriminated against or haven't had spaces to be who they are, to love the way they do, to uh, make the, mus the, the music they want to make, to express their stories and their beliefs and you name it, right? So uh, it always comes to me as this idea of justice and the role that we have through the arts. And we know that we have those platforms in which we reach out to people in a very beautiful way, in a very profound way. And I think that is the best thing we can do is to really commit to use those platforms to reshift this because this is about humanness. Uh, it, it goes beyond who, what composer is better than the next or how many audience members are coming or how many students my program has. It's about how we connect and how this empathy uh, that we should have when we face each other is acting as the way to connect. And that will perpetuate our programs. Otherwise, I mean, honestly, yeah, there's no reason for me to make music if I am going to continue perpetuating this uh, discrimination and many other uh, uh, byproducts of these situations. Mm -hmm. um, so with that in mind, how what support systems should be in place for, I guess, for students? What are your anyone's thoughts on that? Uh, so we won't continue to perpetuate certain things. How do we build those support systems? Martina? I go back to the first question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. sorry. No, no, no. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, the, the mental, mental health support in our uh, institutions, people and mentors that are able to listen to these issues to the extent that they are affecting it. Openness in these conversations within um, um, our faculty meetings, uh, training and training and more training and normalizing these uh, to the extent that everybody can embrace these ideas of diversity. One you know, two hour seminar a year to, you know, train our faculty to be diverse is not going to be enough. This has to be reinforced and reinforced and reinforced in every way uh, we can for our students as well. There's a lot of resistance in our students. I, I Barrett, you know, this state is a, a conservative state, uh, uh, close minded at many levels, open minded at other levels. So. That's why it's important also to get to know our demographics, to get to know our communities and, and, and mediate. But it's, it's a conversation, it's a constant uh, reminder that this is happening, that we are not making this up. And just, I just want to quickly applaud one of my colleagues at, at Juilliard, Christina Salgado, who has um, done much to uh, provide um, communities, affinity groups, opportunities for students to have conversations, uh, you know, about what they would like to see from their institution, what they want from their education, and really giving them agency. I think if we, if we're not providing our students with some sense of agency in their own um, education and their experience on campus, they're here for such a short amount of time, like it's just a snapshot. But then it becomes, at least for me, like that that snapshot, those few years that you had at the institutions that you attended, become life changing experiences. So. Yeah, and I was actually going to say just what Barrett said is that student groups where they have that opportunity to communicate, I was going to say just one cool thing that our um, U of M MTNA Collegiate chapter did was they hosted their own concert of um, underrepresented um, composers. And it was really cool because they organized it. They did all the work. You know, they asked me to come in and participate. But, you know, it was really student driven. And I think when we can create or, or encourage them to create those spaces, that's really important. And I want to add to that this that is happening here is very important, right? How we connect at this level interinstitutionally, right? With our strengths and our ideas and, and, and creating a stronger groups that with, again, the power we have from our platforms, we can move this change faster. Uh, I, I know, for example, that I need my peer from Juliet and Curtis and uh, these main organizations and institutions 
to change their repertoire. Uh, if that happens there, it's easier for us to change it over here, right? So how do we empower this conversation and, and we connect that power with more knowledge, uh, with more conversations, so we can together um, join forces and, and, and move the change? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, before I go to our final question, uh, I want to ask, uh, what are some greatest challenges or opportunities, however you see that, um, that you all have faced um, as educators, I guess, during this pandemic? And what do you think some of the greatest challenges uh, students have faced as well? Um, Barrett. <laughs> well, I mean, for us in student development, it's uh, certainly been, again, to circle back to mental health, uh, just to ensure that our students are actually thriving in an environment that's unfamiliar to us. Uh, like we're educators and we've been doing this, like this is my 15th year at Juilliard and this is, you know, new, completely new territory in so many ways. Um, so to reassure our students that um, we have, you know, their best interests at heart, that we are doing everything that we can to support them in an unfamiliar and at times scary environment. Uh, we have students that have lost family members to COVID. We have uh, students that have um, you know, struggle to make ends meet because they're not able to work uh, during COVID. Um, and the ways in which we support our students have, um, uh, we're in some ways we're having to reinvent. And in a lot of ways, you know, at, as with the session to, to really innovate and consider uh, in what ways are, are we supporting our students? And in what ways, at least now, and I'm just going to knock on wood and say, I, I, I hope that we're done with this pandemic at some point very, very soon. Uh, but to say, at least for now, we have some very important takeaways for what it is that our students need, um, what it is that we can do to best uh, support their mental health, their physical health, ensure that they're thriving in an environment uh, that is intense. Um, I didn't go to Juilliard, uh, but I went to you know, the University of Arkansas for my undergrad. Uh, but as a musician, uh, you know, as an artist, you put so much stress upon yourself. You put so much, you put expectations upon yourself that are so critical to you and your craft. Um, I, you know, it, it's, it, our students are, music students are tough and they're, they, you know, they, they, they experience things that uh, some colleagues in other areas don't, or that their fellow students don't. And I just want to add to that connectivity. I mean, I think we're all lacking and yearning for that, you know, so much more than maybe we even knew before the pandemic, just that human connection. It's been um, really obvious how much we need that and how much that helps us and how much we feed off that as creative people. So I, I think that would go for everyone. You know, I, I miss them, the students, just as much as they've missed being with us. So um, the more we can create opportunities to connect, the better, especially as we as you stay buried, hopefully see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, Leah, thank you. Yeah, I, um, all of that plus, I don't know, I wanna think that we need, we need to really understand that there's no way to cut and paste, that this pandemic is not just something that happened and that we can forget about. Uh, and I think that that has been the urgency of many organizations and, and many of us as well, out of desperation. How can we go back to you know what we were doing and uh, go back to normal? I think our new normal is different. And I think uh, this level of introspection and suffering for many and self-realizations, I think I hope this is an opportunity to really uh, bring new outlets and new opportunities to teach, to connect, to reevaluate the things that were working or were not working under new uh, eyes as well. So um, I think that um, that's that's probably what what I keep having that conversation uh, at, at least in my institution. Right? Uh, how are we going to change? How are we going to uh, sustain this change that has started that was forced on us? but that is there and is still there uh, asking for our uh, solutions and our uh, innovation. Yeah, thank you all. And I think there's a greater level of fear that students have now. I, I think, you know, 
students in music have probably always had a fear of like the music industry and entering into it. But um, I'm hearing that it's even uh, just a greater fear right now. Um, so um, what final thoughts do all of you have on how people can get active and in innovating in higher education? And lastly, uh, please share how people can reach you. Uh, I'll start with uh, Artina. Uh, yeah, well, I think you should just be the change that you want to see. I mean, again, I think what happens outside of the institution really affects the institution. And then it also makes for the change that we see in the institutions. So whatever you want to do, a nonprofit in your community, organizations um, that you might be affiliated, things in your church, what, whatever you can do to be the change that you want to see in larger institutions, I think that you should do that. Um, and where you can find me, you can find me at Artina McKay all places. My website is also artinamccain.com. So I would love to, you know, be more in contact with all of you uh, in the chat. Thank you. And Leah? I, um, I just want to encourage everybody to continue finding their voices and to be super proud of who you are and to bring all of that richness to the forefront um, is sometimes difficult to keep that you know attitude of uh, i uh, of um, hope and um and, and strength to continue going but uh our voices and especially our voices are important in this conversation we need that advocacy we need those experiences we need the happiness of be who we are we need to celebrate and to bring all of these to to our doings and to our environments uh in, in the music we, cho we choose to play uh, find mentors as well, find mentors that look like you and think like you and understand who you are and uh, be a mentor as well. And um, you can all find me as Leah Uribe uh, everywhere in the, in the socials and uh, at the University of Arkansas Music Department website. Thank you. Bert. Um, uh, just always Think about our students and how incredible they are and how they're uh, truly ambassadors uh, in ways that we sort of mold them to be so uh, but also remember that their lens uh, both artistically and through lived experience is so different than our own i mean i'm from arkansas and i'm in new york city <laughs> for like 15 years now it's uh this is a a different enough place for me to understand that um, our students uh need to feel as though um uh, they're heard, uh, they're respected, they're honored, they're, they understand what it means to have a vision that is respected by their own institution. So to me, that's uh, really, really important. And you can, anyone can email me at any time. I'm bhypes at juilliard.edu uh, or bear at hypes at gmail.com even. So just. <laughs> that almost sounds like a rapper name, B hypes. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. The, the students at orientation call me B-Hypes and they shout it sometimes. Right. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Um, and I'm Rod Vester. You can find me on rodvester.com or Shenandoah University. Um, so uh, thank you, Artina, Barrett, and Leah. Um, I am so delighted to have spent this time with all of you today. And uh, thank all of you, of course, for joining us today. Uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, we, look for, we look forward to seeing you back at 6 p.m. Eastern time for tonight's closing plenary with Weston Sprott and Laura Downs. Thank you so much. <laughs>